Um, I want to welcome, I have a special welcome for Ravi every time he comes. Uh, it is always good to see him. It's like a family member that's, you know, away and comes back for Christmas. This is our Christmas every time you come back, so <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, and there was something else I was going to mention. Oh, Hilda. Continue praying for Hilda. Hilda Andrade. Uh, she's here and wonderful, but she's still dealing with the balance issue. So we want to pray that all the way through. Um, so glad to see you, though. And then Hilda Backus. Um, she, I, I went and saw her Friday. And from a week ago Friday to this past Friday, what improvement. She was not uh, really responding a whole lot a week ago, but yesterday she can open her eyes. She was talking, she was communicating. Um, she had done therapy before I got there and was sitting on the edge of her bed, able to stand up. So your prayers, God is working in his timing, his way, but your prayers continue on with them because she's not out of the woods yet. Um, any other update on, on her? Oh, today. Okay. 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 So if she can pass that swallow test, then she can go back to eating normally and, and building her strength. So, all right, we'll definitely be praying for that. Speaking of, of swallowing, um, we have some, some tests here that needs some volunteers. Oh. Excellent. Virginia doesn't even know what it's for. I love that spirit. <laughs> Come on down. All right, we need three volunteers, so we need two more. Yes, Maria. I love it, love it, love it. Let's get a guy. Come on, a brave guy. All right, Chuckith. Come on up. Okay, so we'll just take one at a time. So we'll have the two ladies first. Chuck, you'll go last. Um, and so what you're going to do, so you right here, Virginia, have a stand right there. Okay, so we have, you can't really see it, but cups A, B, A, B, A, B. You remember on, on commercials, well, long, long time ago, how they do a taste test, the brand versus the off-brand. So we want to see if you can tell the difference which pretzel is the brand and which one's the off-brand, all right? So brand, off-brand, brand, off-brand, they're mixed up. We don't know where they are. But you try one, and then you try the other, and you tell us which one you think it is. Okay, so first pretzel. Uh -huh. you're, you're only going to do yes. this, yeah. Okay. Well, that's the off-brand. Oh, why do you say that? Because it tastes blander. <laughs> and this one's saltier. Oh, okay, we'll see. Let's uh, reveal it. Is she right? I don't have anything written underneath there. All right. <laughs> yes, yeah, she was right. She got the A was the, just, I mean, powerfully. No? Why not? She doesn't eat junk. Oh, you're such a good example. Okay, we need someone who can eat junk. All right, come on up, Hilda. All right. So you get option number two. It's hard to get like brand name fruit <laughs> and not fruit, but we'll look at that next time. All right, so you get Sprite or lemon, whatever you call that. Twisted. Twisted, whatever. So one is the brand and the other one's the off brand. Oh, <laughs> wow, look at that. She was right. A again. You guys are very good. It's quite interesting when you look at it. It's the real deal is very clear. The off brand has a little tinge to it. Mm -hmm. Yep, and with the pretzels, the, the name brand is a little bigger, saltier, she said. The other one's thicker but smaller. Hmm. Okay, Chuck. <laughs> we have Oreo cookies. <laughs> I haven't eaten an Oreo for a long time. Oh, this is good. All right, so which one's the real deal and which one's a counterfeit? <clears throat> and I can't look at it and read it. No, right? no, you can't. <laughs> oh. I didn't even think about well, that. I don't have my glasses on. Oh, good, no that. Braille. Oh, 
That's an Oreo. All right. Maybe. Well, now you got to try the next one. <laughs> Maybe. Don't look. <laughs> Do you need a palate cleanse or anything? <laughs> I would say that this one right here is the real one. This one's the real one. Oh, I'm so glad finally one got it wrong. This no, was I the real no, deal. <laughs> but you know what? If he had read it, you're right. It would have told the secret. But okay, so they were close though. They were close. Real wrong and count, close. wrong but close. How much like some love experiences, right? We're talking about summer love series. We've been going over the whole series. How do you know if love is the real deal, not the counterfeit kind? It endures. It's patient, it's kind, it's not rude. We've been talking about this, right? What did you say? Trust. Trust, yeah, all right. Well, what if, is it possible that just like these food items and drinks, is it possible that something could look like love, smell like love, taste like love, feel like love, and still not be love? We've probably all experienced the counterfeit. <laughs> we have all experienced that really wasn't love experience. The kind that tasted and lasted, excuse me, the kind that lasted as long as the night or until something better came along, right? The kind that kept it together, didn't lose the temper as long as things went their way. The kind that said, I love you, and yet somehow in the same breath made you feel unlovable, mm -hmm. right? We've all experienced the counterfeit. We've all, in our relationship, somewhere along the way, with our parents or with those that we've been in a relationship of some kind, the not good taste of love have claimed to be true and turned out it wasn't. And two, when we're honest, we have given counterfeit love. We have said love, we've acted love that wasn't the real deal. There have been times we know all too well where we've been patronizingly patient, right, with someone. We've been fake smilingly kind. And we've been proudly not proud. I mean proudly proud, not that proud that we're not proud, right? We know how to appear like we need to appear sometimes outwardly. All the while, we can be thinking our own thoughts that no one sees, right? We can act patient, kind, and proud, but rather we are thinking these people are incompetently slow idiots that aren't as great as I am, right? We can be perfectly loving on the outside while inside our feelings, our thinkings, are wanting something else for ourselves or for the other person stands truer. I wonder if Paul may have wanted to address this when he wrote in 1 Corinthians, and let me pull 1 Corinthians, you can pull it up on your phones and your Bibles, that wonderful chapter 13, when he wrote, Verses six and seven, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, it believes all things. Verse seven, it hopes all things and endures all things. I wonder if perhaps he's done his list. Love is patient, love is kind, it's not rude, it's not self-centered, it's not proud. He's saying, is that everything? Does that capture everything that love is? Has, I, has it completely done? And he's not so sure, and so he writes these next two verses essentially saying, look, look, if you're good with anything, that's not good whether for you or for others, in whatever situation, if you're okay with what isn't okay with God's heart, with God's ways, with God's kind of love, that isn't truly love. It's not the real deal. You've got to, verse seven, truly, truthfully, the end of verse six actually, truly, truthfully love inside and out. Agape love 
is not just on the surface, but it's deeply, abidingly, unflinchingly, comprehensively love. It bears all things. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So love doesn't delight in evil. We're going to break these two verses down. I want to do a quick rundown of what that covers. Delight. It doesn't delight in evil. It doesn't rejoice in. It doesn't stand with. It doesn't support. It doesn't encourage. Love doesn't rejoice, doesn't delight in evil. So what's the definition of evil? Well, there's two. When you look at the Greek word, there are two specific definitions of evil. The first is injustice, injustices that are done. So love does not rejoice in, doesn't stand with, doesn't support, doesn't encourage injustice. Here's a question to test the quality of the realness of our love. Do we? Are we, you and I, are we rejoicing in in any way? Are we supporting in any way? Are we encouraging? Are we standing with any injustices in our family? Any injustices at work? Any injustices in our community? Any injustices in our nation? Any injustices in our world? Perhaps not at our hands directly, but are we allowing it to go on? Are we standing silent? Because if we don't try to do something, if we don't seek to reverse injustice, isn't that a little bit the same thing as supporting it? What is evil number two? Evil number two, according to the Greek definition, any unrighteousness. Unrighteousness, which is un rightness unright what's the opposite of unright what is unright another word for unright wrong <laughs> so how do we determine what is wrong right how do we determine determine well we're going to speak as followers of god as followers of god anything that is in the opposite direction of god of who god is Anything that is in the opposite direction of what God stands for. God is righteousness, rightness. He is the standard of rightness, right? So if he's the standard, what do we know about the standard? We're going to go down the logic. What do we know? What does the Bible say about God, about Jesus? Who does the Bible say God is, that what he's about? It's helpful for us to determine what it means to be in his direction and not in his direction, right? Well, the Bible has two definitive things, two definitive things about God. He is spirit and he is love. Those are the only two, is. God is definitively spirit and love. And when he, the standard setter, was asked what law, what command, what must was the most important to achieve right living, righteousness, right living? What was the most important, law, command, or must? What did Jesus answer? I'll give you the greatest two. Not just one. That's right. I'll give you the greatest two, the most, musts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. When we're trying to say, okay, if love does not rejoice in evil, what is evil? The definition of evil, of not rightness, is anything that is the opposite of love. Love for God and love for each other, the right kind of love. And we have in scripture, scriptures that talk about the fruit of the spirit. If he is love, the fruit that comes out of the spirit, the fruit that is born out of love is selflessness, is patience, is kindness, is gentleness, is peacefulness, is joyfulness, is goodness and self-control and faithfulness. So determining whether something is real or counterfeit in us or with those we're in relationship with, 
are we rejoicing in? Are we standing with? Are we supporting or encouraging in ourselves or in others anything that is the opposite of love? Any unrightness, anything opposite of loving God and loving our neighbors? We've been given in the gospel Jesus' own test of authentic love. It's not when we love those who love us, but as Luke says, that's the easy kind of love. When you just love, so not that that's not, that's good. We want to love people who love us and are like us, right? But rather the indicator of real love is when we love our enemies. That's the real indication of love. When we love those who are against us. How do we speak about them? How do we treat those? How do we think about those who seem to live opposite or fight against our values or against our politics or against our religion? How do we speak about, treat, and think of those who go against whatever we think is right and good and just? True love, it says, is when we, instead of rejoicing in their demise or their destruction or their guilty verdicts, we seek to be patient. We seek to be kind. We seek to be not rude. We seek to put them first, to see them as more important than us, to serve them, to bless them when we love them as God loves us. How are we possibly gonna do that? Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. We're watching a lot of stuff on the news, right? A lot of stuff on the news. What's going on in our insides with those we don't agree with? What's going on in our hearts and our thoughts? Love does not delight in evil, but love rejoices with the truth. Now, I am so glad Paul put both sides of this. So glad. Because we all know what it's like when people who want the best for us only focus on the first part. Don't delight in evil. Don't delight in evil, they say, and they live their life pointing out to us all the delights of evil that we must not do. Right? Do not do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't, don't then becomes their song and refrain, right? Whether it's a religion or a person. They care about you, but they've become your patron saint in your life to show you what not to do. But Paul makes it very clear that there's a whole package that brings life. Not just putting off what hinders our life, but stepping into that which builds life. 1 Corinthians 8 says love builds up. And then you go into Hebrews 12, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Don't delight. Don't delight in injustice. Don't delight in unrightness and anything that's anti-love. Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us do what instead? Run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is love, so that you will not grow weary and not lose heart. In out and throughout scripture, there is always both and. You let go of this so you can grab a hold of life. That life is Jesus. I find this especially interesting, noticing that 1 Corinthians 13, 6 says, rejoice with the truth. It says, love does not delight in evil, but love rejoices with the truth. Why didn't it say in the truth? Because what? They go together. All right, we're going to see how that works. It could have said in the truth. We could have had in these truths you need to rejoice in. But the choice that he made was with. Why did it go so well together? It made me think, and I am just going to put a little theory out here. It made me think of when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Right? Could it be possible that Paul knew Jesus had said that? They were alive at the same time, right? Could he have heard that? 
Maybe, maybe not. Could it have been that he had a play on words, hoping some might replace the word truth with Jesus? I like to think maybe, because it's pretty powerful when you do. Love does not delight in injustices or in any unrightness, any act or word or thought that is opposite of love, but love rejoices or stands with Jesus. Rejoices, stands with all that Jesus stands for. Encourages and delights in all that Jesus encouraged and in all that delights him. Rejoices with the truth, the real deal with the most authentic and genuine version of word and action and thought, stands with and reflects the truth of Jesus' heart inside and out. Jesus was like this personification, literally, of love, of truth, of what truth is, the kind of truth, the kind of true love that is better than life, according to Psalm 63. It says, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you, my soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. Not the junk kind, the richest of foods. So there's a life check here, how we're loving, Is our love better than life for others? Are we giving them the taste of richest food for the soul because of how we love them, how we speak with them, even in the tiniest way? Well, if you're like me, I'm thinking, no, (laughs) probably not. I mean, maybe a little tiny bit sometimes. Not only are we imperfect vessels, you know, we are imperfect vessels. It says we're broken, we've got cracks in us, we're made of clay. God still puts it in us. But we get tripped up all the time, right? We get tripped up like wearing shoes that are too big. You remember putting on your parents' shoes? Or my dad, he, every once in a while, played a clown. And he had these huge clown shoes. And as a little girl, I would go and step inside of them. And it was really hard to walk. You easily trip up over the shoes because I hadn't grown up even in my parents' shoes or clown shoes. I hadn't grown into them yet. But we might also be thinking, if we're honest about our humanity, have you seen the people, have you seen the others in my life that were supposed to be loving? Mm -hmm. Annoying. Difficult. Annoying, right? And they certainly, they certainly aren't loving me like God loves either, right? It's both. Far from being the rich food that satisfies my soul, far from being the rich food, they're more like slimy okra or maybe rotten eggs. I I know. I'm sorry I had to put it in there, though. (laughs) You can have my okra. Okay. So maybe, 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 maybe a solution would be if we could choose, like we could choose here, We could choose who we loved, or like we choose food from a menu, what would work better? We could choose the traits that they come with. Like we could go to a 31 flavors of human beings, and we could select the toppings that we want our humans to be on. Build a bear for humans. We put in only those things that we want, right? I loved, Max Lucado inspired me, his chapter on verse seven, particularly, or six, was really good because he compared choosing who and how to love like choosing food in a cafeteria line. Let me just give you a couple examples. Parents choosing their traits for kids. We could choose a plate of good grades and cute smiles, but we'll pass on the teenage identity crisis and tuition bills, right? Kids with parents. We'll take a double helping of allowances and free lodging, but no rules or curfews, thank you very much, right? Spouses. How about a bowl of good health and good moods, but job transfers, in-laws, and laundry? I just can't. It's not on my diet plan. If we could choose like that, right? If love were like a cafeteria line, it would be so much easier, wouldn't it? We would get to choose what would work for us. It would be neater. It would be painless. It would be peaceful. 
But according to 1 Corinthians 13, it wouldn't be love. It would not be love. Verse 7 indicates love is willing to accept not just a few things, but all things. I want to just put a pause here. Nelson, would you mind checking if the air is on? It's feeling warm. Please, thank you. It's feeling a little warm. Well, I should be more loving. It says bears all things. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I find it interesting that this verse, 7, comes right off the heels of verse 6 because you go from don't rejoice in evil or injustice or wrongs. Don't rejoice, don't delight in it that you or others do, whether you do it or others. Don't delight in evil. Don't delight in people that are doing injustices or unrightness kind of, don't rejoice in them. But then verse seven comes along and says, but don't write them off either. Love doesn't write them off. Love them anyway. Love bears all things. Love doesn't support wrongdoing or hurtful living, but it doesn't write people off. It rejoices with the truth, with witness, with truth, with Jesus, relationship, Emmanuel, God with us. Love rejoices with truth, with truth that includes relationship, good news of grace and forgiveness and gentleness and self-control and peace and patience. So when we love someone, truly, authentically, we don't pick and choose to love only the best parts. We don't pick and choose to love only the best parts, and we don't get to write them off. We do get to seek God's spirit. We do get to choose to stand with truth, with Jesus, so that his spirit inside us can help us bear all things. Because his spirit in us, when we stand with Jesus, his spirit in us can help us believe and hope and endure all things. We take the entire package, no large helpings of the good and passing on the bad. It's a package deal. We are not talking about abuse here. I'm not talking about some forms that are just unhealthy. But in general, when we're talking about characteristics, those annoying things that we just don't like that get under our skin, we learn to love the whole package deal. Brings us back to the original lament, though. How do we love people? How do we love people who are less than satisfying in their ways? How do we love those difficult people or those people who make bad choices? I think Paul faced this same question. In fact, that's the reason why we have the First Corinthians book at all. The church that he began in the southern part of Greece had gone wacko. And the first 12 chapters, the first 12 chapters outlines just how wacko they had gone, right? So here's it goes. When it comes to unity, I'm just going to do a little rundown of what the First Corinthians church looks like. The members of Corinth were way out of step with each other. They were quarreling, it says, about many issues. And you look at the word quarreling, it actually means, the Greek word, is the same word used to describe battles in war. So this wasn't any bickering, minor bickering. These are all-out wars, battles, right? So it shows how unsavory they were, this dear church family members at war over a multitude of issues. The issues were leadership. You had issues. They were like split into four teams. There were some members who rallied around Paul because he was the church founder. There were some who liked Apollos because he was a very dynamic speaker. There were some that preferred Peter because he was, you know, the original apostles, and we like to go with the name brand. And there were those who followed Jesus. Right? Well, you think, well, shouldn't all follow Jesus? But that kind of gave them an opt-out of following any earthly or present leader. Right? So they were at war over leadership. They were at war over morality. There was one issue in particular that they brought up. An example was an issue of a man having an affair with his father's wife. Okay. Even the Corinthians, there was, a, there was a Roman law back then that said you could not, you prohibited a son from marrying his father's wife even if the father died. 
he couldn't marry his father's wife. It was that. that. So in, in not Christian, not God-following society, they had that rule as well. But apparently, this church just looked the other way. It wasn't encouraging any get with the truthness or godness in the situation at all. They just said, let them do what they want to do. And it apparently wasn't incest because it, it doesn't mention that it was his mom. So it was just his father's wife and that was that. They just shoved it under the carpet. The third issue was shallow theology. This was between the meat eaters and the non-meat eaters, right? <laughs> Vegetarians, go! The controversy was, can we eat meat that has been offered to idols? The pro-meats said yes. After all, Paul had said, we all know that an idol is not really a god, and there is only one god and no other, 1 Corinthians 8, 4. So they had no problem eating meat from idols. The anti-meat people, though, they had a conscious problem. Some were accustomed to thinking of idols as real. From their past history, idols were very real to them. So when they ate food that had been offered to idols, they thought of it as worship of real gods, and their weak consciousness were violated. So the anti-meat struggled with making the break to new thinking, and the pro-meat struggled with being patient with those who weren't embracing their freedom in Christ. That was just three issues, right? Boom, boom, boom. Worship. Another one, they had trouble with order, particularly a veiled issue. Did you guys get that? You got it. All right. The issue was veils. The women in the congregation were not wearing veils. Ladies, it was in highly immoral, improper. And so they're all in up in arms with these ladies who are trying to be free. Wow, women's rights back then. They had issues with the Lord's Supper. This one cracked me up. The Lord's Supper, right? So in Cor Corinth at this time, the Lord's Supper was not just crackers and wine. It was a whole beautiful meal that you would enjoy, but it was supposed to be food and fellowship and worship. But some of the members, they were missing the point. They would come early. They liked the food. They didn't so much care for the fellowship or worship. So they arrived early, ate heartily, and left leaving no fruit on the table for the others, right? And so finally, then the fat last issue was fruit. Fruit at the communion table wasn't it, but fruit of the Holy Spirit. They had conflicts between themselves about the gifts that the Holy Spirit had given. Some were happy and very proud of the gifts the Holy Spirit had given, while others felt very short-changed. And so the wars went on. You get the picture, right? Very conflicted. There was a problem in every stone pew going down. There was selfishness and mor morally adrift and theologically intolerant, and pretty much everyone was thoughtless of everyone else. So here's Paul. Here's Paul. What do you do with that? Well, love doesn't rejoice in evil, but delights with the truth. Paul tried that. For 12 chapters, he tried that. He instructed, he corrected, he reasoned with them. But at some point, Paul decides he needs to try a different tactic. He stopped talking to the head, and he started appealing to the heart. And that's where we get chapter 13. And he says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Parents and teachers especially, I think, would understand Paul's heart and why he changed tactics. You've got two kids, whether in a classroom or at home, going at each other's throats, right? You wish it wouldn't be this way, but day after day it happens. And so like every other day, you rush to the battlefront to find out what's going on and how we can stop it. He threw my baby don't potty out the window while she stepped on my white, my you know, Nintendo, WWF Nintendo game. Right, okay, and off they go. He did this, she did this, he did that, he did, she did. You shake your head. You wonder why the kids couldn't have been blessed with your side of the family's family traits. <laughs> Finally, you shout, time out. Just time out. You forget the problems. You say you're going to start at the heart of the matter, right? And you speak to the kids then about something higher than toys, something grander than games. You speak to them about love. You speak to them about family about relationships, you, you dry your tears, you stroke his head, and you wax eloquently on the topic of sticking together and looking out for each other. You tell them that life is too short for fights. You tell them people are too precious for anger. 
And in the end, the only thing that really solves everything is love. And so they listen, and they nod, and you're pretty sure they're going to go back to fighting. But at least you planted a seed. And I think that's where Paul was. His chapter 13 is a timeout. His chapter 13 is a timeout. His solution to all the raging battles is to love, agape love. Agape love that goes beyond the surface of the right words and actions to the real, authentic heart and spirit of withness, of being with Jesus, in step with Jesus, so that you can be more in step with each other. God was gracious. This is why we even have this option, because God was so gracious. Agape love forgives the mistake when the offense is high. Agape offers patience when stress is abundant and extends kindness when kindness is rare, because God offered and offers this to us without end. Agape love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things because God did and does this for us. This is the type of love that Paul prescribed for the church of Corinth. This whole book, he he takes this whole book and the, the point that he makes, the prescription that he prescribes for them is good for us today because we have groups that fight in our families, in our communities, fight each other, we see it in the news, we see it in the schools. Sometimes we're quiet when we should speak. Sometimes we get annoyed with those who haven't found the same freedom. We have the same issues. And we know and we believe that one day there will be an entire people where everyone does indeed behave with Jesus's heart and spirit and no one's gonna complain, including ourselves, but it won't be this side of heaven. It won't be this side of heaven because we are in broken vessels. So until then, what do we do? We encourage withness, with Jesus, with the truths of grace and forgiveness. We reason, we teach, we challenge, but most of all, we love. Even the difficult, especially the difficult. We love like Catherine Laws. The story I'm gonna end with is about this woman who loved the inmates of Sing Sing Prison. You've all heard of the most atrocious Sing Sing Prison, right? Her husband, Lewis, had become the warden. It was 1921. She was a young mother of three daughters, and everybody warned her never to step foot inside those walls but she didn't listen to them. Catherine took seriously the idea that the prisoners were human beings. No matter how hardened and how bad, they were human beings worthy of attention and respect. And so Catherine, much to the chagrin of her friends and family, regularly visited inside the walls of Sing Sing. She would encourage the prisoners. She ran errands for the prisoners. She spent time listening to them, and most importantly, she cared about them. And as a result, these hardcore prisoners cared deeply about her. When the first prison basketball game was held, she went, three girls in tow. She sat in the stadium seats in the bleachers there alongside of the inmates. She once said, my husband and I are going to take care of these men, and I believe they will take care of me. I don't have to worry. When she heard that one convicted murderer was blind, she taught him Braille so he could read. On learning the inmates that were hearing impaired, she studied sign language so that they could communicate. For 16 years, Catherine Laws softened the hard hearts of the men of Sing Sing, and in 1937, the world saw the difference authentic love makes. The prisoners knew something was wrong that morning when Louis Laws didn't report to work. Quickly, the word spread between the cells that Catherine had been killed in an accident. 
The following day, her body was placed in her home, which is about three quarters of a mile from the prison. As the acting warden took his early morning walk, he noticed a large gathering at the main gate. Every prisoner that could reach the fence were pressed against it. Eyes with tears, faces solemn, no one spoke or moved. They'd come to stand as close as they could to the woman who had given them so much love. And then the warden made a remarkable decision. When I read this, I doubted the validity of it because it sounded too far-fetched. But then when I, I looked into New York history and all of that, it was verified. This warden let the men go to show their love and support. He unlocked the gate. And these American hardened criminals, murderers, robbers, the men that the nation had walked away, when he unlocked the gate for them, they walked to the home of Catherine Laws to pay their last respect. And there were so many of them, they could not all be guarded. Not one tried to escape. Not one tried to duck away and hide. And to a person, every single one of them returned back to their cell. <clears throat> Real love, authentic love from the inside out changes people. We know because God changes us, right? We've experienced, we find ourselves from time to time in prisons of our own makings, not able to see beyond walls and graves and hopeless situations not able to know what's next, what's our purpose, what difference we possibly are making or can make, but God takes the time and he gives us new eyes and new perspectives and new directions. We, like the prisoners, sometimes can't hear. We can't hear God's voice, we can't hear his heart, we can't hear his forgiveness, we can't hear his delight in us, or as it says in Zephaniah, his singing over us. And we find it hard to believe that his grace, his kindness is for us. But then God finds a way to speak our language. He finds a way to reach us through a person, through a book, through a song, through a moment of his spirit. He breaks through so he can set us free, so we can know him so we can have that peaceful, hopeful, abundant life he promises. Acts 17 says, he made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living so we could seek after God and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. We find life and we are free to live fully, free to even run, like those prisoners could have done, free to harden our hearts, free to break away from God. He gives us that love that is freedom. But when we've really found him, we don't. Or when we do, it seems we find ourselves drawn back again and again to this God. Why? Because we've never, if we're honest, we've never been loved like this before, right? We know there is no one and nothing that can compare to the love of God. Amen. We've never found hope like this, or peace, or comfort, or help. We've never found anything more authentic, more real than the love of God. Better than life, the psalm says. Our souls satisfied as with the richest of foods. My belief from scriptures is that we can grow in love like this. Not in delighting in justices or anything that's not of God's heart, but rejoicing with the truth, with Jesus' way of love, bearing all things. I believe the scripture tells us we can grow in love like this because he first loved us. And because as Romans 5.5 5 says, God has given us the Holy Spirit, who fills our hearts with his love. And as he comes into our hearts and minds and every moment that we invite him to do so, he transforms and lives through us 
bringing that life to others as he brings to us. Let's pray. God, this love is beyond all imagination, grander than any thought, any experience we have ever had. And God, when we are experiencing those imprisoned times, when we are experiencing darkness and the walls that we can't seem to break through and we feel inhibited and stuck in our lives, remind us that you set us free. Not in every situation, not every situation is gonna look like the freedom we think we should have, but God, your love sets us free in our spirit, in our minds, in our hearts, in our souls. And God, we want that kind of love. We want the kind of love that does not rejoice in things that are opposite of you. And so anything that is in our life, God, anything that is in our life that is, that is delighting in the opposite of who you are, that is delighting and supporting or standing for anything that is opposite of your love, with your spirit in us, give us a strength to say no, to set it aside, to hand it over to you so that it will unlock us and we can be free to do the other side, that love rejoices in the truth, with the truth, that love rejoices with you. God, we look forward to you growing us up into you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.